Hello and welcome to a lecture on locating health facilities and we're going to use evolutionary algorithms to help us do this. So first of all let's uh, recap about location allocation modelling in general. Um, so we know that when we're working with a health service client we'll be doing um, one of several things. So that might be investigating accessibility to the service. How easy is it for patients to access facilities that deliver healthcare? Comparing the quality in terms of efficiency of previous decisions. Um, and that's uh, what we're gonna look at today and in the labs. Um, and also we might be generating alternatives. So we might be suggesting alternative ways to configure the system that would make it more efficient and improve patient outcomes. Uh, so uh, this is linked to optimization, um, and sometimes the problems you'll be dealing with, if, for example, if you're working with a single health facility, might be a small problem. Um, so in those cases, it's best to try and support that as simply as possible. Um, to help people understand things, usually a mix of um, developing a series of geographic maps to understand where demand is coming from and what type of demand is out there and basic analysis is the best way to support those decisions and it might be your analysis includes um, enumerating all possible solutions um, because there's only a small number of combinations you need to look at. But when we get to medium to large scale applications we need to bring in some optimization theory. Um, there's different ways to do that. Today we're going to look at evolutionary algorithms. Um, but we do need to remember that we are trying to support people's decisions, not just solve an optimization problem. And that's really important to remember all the way through. The, solu the optimal solution to your model isn't necessarily the thing that decision makers want to do. They may want to see a variety of good solutions that can help them, that can help them pick what to do. So here's an example of a, of a facility location problem in healthcare. Um, and we're gonna use this as our example throughout. Um, so this is from a real project. It's a study that's been published. Um, this was working with um, public health teams in Hampshire and also a, um, a NHS provider of sexual health services. So these are clinics people go when they've got um, sexual health problems so, for example, um, in this chart of Hampshire, we can see um, different pieces of information represented. So the, the shaded geographic regions um, are postcode sectors. Um, and the, basically, the darker the sector, the more demand that we're seeing in that location. The second piece of information on the map um, is the location of sexual health clinics within Hampshire and the size, those are, those are the red buildings, and the size of those buildings is proportional to the amount of demand that they are currently serving. So this was a problem where the public health teams and the provider felt that actually they had too many facilities and the type of care people were receiving when they walked into a sexual health clinic varied significantly across Hampshire. Um, and there was also an issue with some of these clinics being underutilised. So they were keen to think about if they consolidated to a smaller number of facilities, how many facilities should they choose and where should they be located? So it was a classic optimization problem. And too many, for, uh, too many locations to enumerate all possible solutions. So what is an evolutionary algorithm? Well, it's a type of optimization method that we sometimes call a meta heuristic. Um, it's a population based method. So this means we have more than one candidate solution at a time. We have a population of solutions and an evolutionary approach is one that takes that population and breeds and evolves it over time and it homes in on good or optimal solutions to the problem. 
So in our, the context of our sexual health problem, each of those solutions in the population would represent a combination of um, sexual health clinics that we want to place onto our map. So evolutionary algorithms can also be thought of as a type of reinforcement learning, where over time we've got a target, we've got a goal-driven agent, and it's homing in on a very specific type of objective. And it's also a branch of stochastic optimization. So you're going to find this type of approach used in a whole bunch of disciplines um, in the mathematical literature. So we're going to look at two types of um, approaches to evolutionary algorithms. We're going to look at evolutionary strategies, which I'm a big fan of. These are simple methods. Um, we've got mu lambda and mu plus lambda. Uh, and then we're going to, from there, we're going to use that as a base to build up to a full genetic algorithm approach. Um, we're, we're going to look at single objective approaches this week, but they can be multi-objective as well. Um, and the thing to always keep in mind about evolutionary algorithms is they can be extremely computationally expensive. Um, that means they, have long, they can have long execution times for very big problems where you have very large populations. So with an evolutionary approach, we need to think about how do we represent a solution to our problem. So we do that in EA using something called a chromosome um, so you can think of a chromosome as an array containing an encoding which represents a solution. So two popular approaches are binary integer and integer. So in a binary chromosome, you have that the same length as the number of candidate locations. So if you've got M locations, your array is of length M. And each element is encoded a zero or one. So if it's a one, that means we're placing a pin in our map um, for that particular element. So if, if Facility 5 is encoded 1, that means that Facility 5 is active in the solution. If Facility 4 is coded 0, that means we are not using that within our particular solution. One of the trade-offs of this approach is you need to think very carefully about feasibility. So if you have a limit on the number of facilities you need to place at a particular time, um, then the binary integer representation needs to have some sort of inbuilt way of constraining the number of ones within your chromosome and that again can become computationally expensive. An alternative way to encode it is with an integer format and um, so now our array or chromosome is of length f, the number of facilities we wish to allocate um, and each element is encoded with the index that represents that particular facility. So we've got m facilities so each um, element is encoded with a number between 1 and m. So put a bit, bit of meat on the bone, here is our um, Hampshire sexual health problem. Uh, we've got 28 facilities, let's say we want to place five. Um, and we choose these five here, 20, 15, 12, 2 and 9. Well here's a way to represent that um, as a chromosome in integer format. Now ordering isn't important in this particular problem, so um, it doesn't matter which order the integers go into this array. Um, it's completely um, equal to um, a, a different ordering. There's no different in our, um, our cost. So speaking of cost, um, when you're using evolutionary algorithms, we use a slightly different terminology. We talk about the fitness of a solution, and that just means its quality or its cost. And that is the target that your algorithm is trying to optimise against. Um, so in the sexual health example, which, which had a single objective, um, that might be, for example, the weighted average travel time, as in the p-median problem, or it might be the proportion of demand that sits within a specified target travel time, as in the maximal covering location problem. So the sort of information you're likely to need to pass to a fitness function are the candidate solution, which, is, which will be however you've chosen to represent it, um, the travel time matrix, so the cost of traveling from one location to another, and the demand you're seeing by geographic location. So for example, it might, that might be stroke admissions by lower super output area. And in our sexual health one, that would be the number of people living in a particular super, um, postcode sector. 
stage in evolutionary algorithms is to decide which of the chromosomes should we breed together. And there's various selection operators we can choose from. And depending on whether you're using a full GA or a evolutionary strategy, there, there may be very different approaches. Once we've selected chromosomes for breeding, um, they need to be either they need either to be bred or mutated. So um, breeding algorithms is sometimes called recombination, and it's also sometimes called crossover. But it basically means you have two parents, and you use those two parents to generate one or more children. Mutation is different. So mutation takes a single chromosome and it somehow randomly changes some of the encoding to that chromosome. So there's some form of random mutation. Once you've done that, you generate what's called the next generation. So the next generation is a, is a, is a, is the, is a further iteration of that initial population. So it's changed through evolution. And then we loop back around and we reselect new chromosomes for breeding using whatever selection operator we have and they go back through crossover and mutation and you're back to the next generation again and you continue to execute that until either the algorithm converges or you run out of time. So it's useful to also look at that within pseudocode um, so we can see here that we need some sort of function for generating an initial population so again, that might be random. You need some way of keeping track of what the best solution or best solutions are that you have located. You need some way to evaluate the fitness of the population in a loop. And you also need to be able to check that uh, which of those, which of that population is the best. And then finally, we have a join operation which, which joins the current population with um, a newly bred population. That's your next generation that you produce there. And you might include some of the old population or you might have a purely brand new evolved population. Pictorial form. So mu lambda starts off with an initial population of size lambda. So that's a parameter that we've specified. So typically that's a randomly initialized population. The selection operator that mu lambda uses is called truncation selection. So we, we have a tunable parameter called mu and we basically set that to say 20 or 50 or 100 and that keeps the mu best. So it will keep, for example, the 20 fittest solutions within your population and it deletes the rest. There's no crossover within um, an evolutionary strategy. Instead, it primarily uses mutation. So it will mutate each of those mu best, lambda divided by mu times. So it does that by, ra by randomly changing some of the encoding. Um, and if you do that for each of the mu, you end up with a next generation of mutants. Um, and that mutant's population size is lambda. And then you loop back round and you do your truncation selection again and continue back through that mutation cycle um, until you converge or you run out of time. So there's three tunable parameters here I'd like you to take note of. One is the initial population size. Second is mu. That's what you use for your truncation selection. And then third is the mutation operator itself. So that's something that you would need to um, conceptualize and code. So mu plus lambda, which is very similar. If we start off with an initial population of size lambda, we again use truncation selection, so we keep the mu best and delete the rest. We use mutation, but the difference comes in our next generation. So mu lambda brings in something called elitism. Um, so the next generation is of size mu plus lambda. And then all generations from that point on are of that size. So you have lambda mutants of the mu fittest, but you also keep the mu fit fittest of the previous generation. So you're bringing in the best solutions you found in the previous generation. 
So you're passing those down through the generations and you iterate again until you run out of time. So if we briefly compare the two approaches, um, the main difference is elitism. Um, and that all that means is the fittest parents from the previous generation persist through um, your cycles. So there's some clear benefits of that. Um, if you're keeping those high performing or high fitness solutions within your population, you have the opportunity to breed them with other high performing solutions that you find um, through um, iteration. Uh, but elitism is, can be problematic as well. So it's, it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, so one of the, one of the issues um, in reinforcement learning is exploitation versus exploration. So the more elitist your algorithm, the less exploratory it is. So the more mutants you have in your population, the more likely you are to explore the full solution space um, and get a feel for where some of those good solutions are. So you can fail to find the global optimum by following a very elitist approach. So it's a you need to tune that parameter carefully if you're going to use that to avoid getting stuck in a local optimum. Okay, so let's take a closer look at how to create a mutant in an evolutionary strategy. So a simple method is to mutate an element with a, specified, a user specified probability P. So let's take an example. So assume we have eight candidate locations. Um, we have three facilities we wish to place and we've set P to some arbitrary value, 0.3, for example. So here is our solution chromosome, three, eight, and six. Um, and that leaves us with five candidate swaps, one, two, four, five, and seven. So remember our solution space of candidate locations is just one to eight. So let's, let's, let's sample. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll, we will generate um, some random samples to decide if we're going to swap that particular element of the array of our solution. So we can see we've generated three um, zero or one values or yes or no values here. Um, and that has said that um, element one um, is yes, we're going to swap that. Element two, no. And element three, yes. So we know that eight will be in our uh, mutant, but three and six won't be in our mutant. So we now need to do some random sampling to decide uh, which of the candidate swaps we're going to move into our new mutant. So we know we've got to do two. So we've created um, a vector of size two. And we're going to do some sampling without replacement, which means that once we take a number out of that candidate swap array, we're not going to put it back in. We're not going to be able to um, sample that again because that would give us an infeasible solution. So we roll the dice and the first number that we pull out is um, at index two um, and that is number two. And then we roll again and that's number seven. So those are, the, those are the facilities that we're going to put into our mutant. And we simply concatenate number eight with um, two and seven. And that is, our, that is our mutant. So we repeat that operation for as many times as we need to in order to build up the population size that is required for our evolutionary strategy. OK, so the final part of this lecture is about genetic algorithms, full genetic algorithms. So we've built up from our evolutionary algorithms and now we're going to introduce some additional steps um, to get even more diversity um, and better solutions from our evolutionary approach. So let's think about that pictorially first. So very much like evolutionary strategies, we start off with a randomly generated initial population of size lambda. We then apply a selection operator, a particular way of choosing best, um, choosing candidate solutions from our population. And you'll see that's quite different from how we do it in um, evolutionary strategies. In particular, we do that in an iterative manner. 
So we pick two parents from the select using the selection operator. We then use crossover and mutation in order to breed children. And then we go back into our population and we select two more parents um, and go through that crossover and mutation um, process again. And we do that until we have generated the next generation, so a generation of the correct size. Um, and then we repeat that over and over again until we've converged or we've run out of time or we've hit our max number of iterations, depending on how you've set the algorithm up. Let's take a closer look at selection operators. Well, there are many selection operators uh, within the evolutionary literature. Two very popular ones are roulette selection and tournament selection. So in roulette selection, you evaluate the fitness of your entire population, and then you sample with replacement um, from that population proportional to the fitness of that individual. Um, so the very fit, individual, in fit individuals are more likely to be sampled than the lower fit individuals. And there's a way to bias that sampling as well to guarantee that certain individuals are picked. Um, however, it's been, it's been kind of agreed by consensus over time that a better way to, to work with this type of problem is through tournament selection. And that is a very simple um, piece of code to put together. Here's an example. Um, so in tournament selection, you have a champion and basically you are randomly sampling challenges to that champion from um, your population. And if they turn out to be um, to have higher fitness, then they replace the champion and they and then they are further challenged depending on what tournament size you've you've passed in. So we can see here in the pseudocode that we have a variable called best. That's our champion. We're randomly sampling that individual from our population to start off with, with replacement. Um, and then we loop through the tournament size where we randomly choose a challenger from the population, again with replacement. If that challenger has higher fitness than the best, then it becomes the best of our champion. Um, and when that, when that loop is over, we return our champion and that champion has been selected for breeding. So we now turn to crossover or recombination. Again, many ways to do this. The way, I'm, the, the way I'm going to show you today is called single point crossover. I think this works quite well for facility location problems. So here we have two parents that have been through tournament selection um, and we're going to cross those over. We're going to recombine them to create a new solution based on their encodings. So to do this, the first thing we knew is to need to do is create what's called exchange vectors and exchange vectors are elements of those arrays which are unique so that they are so for example 12 is in parent 1 but it is not in parent 2 the same for 15 but we can see that um, facility 2 is in both solutions and we're going to exclude that for within our crossover the next step is to generate our crossover point. So we randomly generate a point between one and the length of the exchange vector and we use that as the point where we are going to exchange. So anything beyond that point is going to be exchanged. So we can see here it splits the arrays exactly in two. So in exchange vector one we're going to swap out nine and twenty and in exchange vector two we're going to swap out eight and twenty one. And then we cross them over, which basically means exchanging those two. So we're going to exchange 9 and 20 and 8 and 21. So just to highlight that, so you can see that I've highlighted 9 and 20 in red in exchange vector 1. And in our crossover um, array, you can see that appears uh, in crossover vector 2. So we now have, instead of 14, 1, 8, 21, we now have 14, 1, 9 and 20. And we're going to do exactly the same thing the other way around. So we move 8 and 21 across. So now instead of 12, 15, 9 and 20, we have 12, 15, 8 and 21. And then the final step is to add in the common facilities into our, into our solution representation, which was 2. 
So our children, we end up with two children, are 12, 15, 8, 21 and 2, and 14, 1, 9, 20 and 2. And it's important to emphasise that this relies on the random sampling of point C. So for example, I, I may have exchanged all of those points, or I may have only exchanged one of them. So that's the random sampling that goes on in crossover. And then we would follow this up with mutation in exactly the same way as we use with evolutionary strategies, mu lambda and mu lambda and mu plus lambda. So just before we end, um, some practical advice on the use of evolutionary algorithms. So I hope you agree that these are really interesting approaches to solving this problem. Um, they're obviously very powerful, um, particularly genetic algorithms, but um, I'd like you to remember that these are computationally expensive procedures and they're not necessarily the first port of call you should go to. If you've got a problem which you can enumerate all solutions, um, then you really should do that. You, shouldn't, you should only be using evolutionary approaches for medium to large size problems. Um, I'd also advise you um, to set a benchmark using a simpler method to start off with. Um, so for example, in the past, what I've done is I've either used a greedy heuristic um, which, uh, or a random search approach to try and to try and get see what sort of solution quality I can get um, just using a simple approach. They're really quick to code, they're normally a few lines of code um, and they're very fast so you can get answers very quickly and that sets you a benchmark that your more complex evolutionary approach should be able to beat and kind of justify if you, you know justify the use of them really. The other benefit of a simpler approach versus evolutionary algorithms is it's much easier for a health service client to understand. Um, however, it may, be, it may be giving them bad advice, so you do need to bear that in mind. So you should, you should be using that as a benchmark with the added benefit that you may be able to use this to explain um, how you're solving that problem to a health service client. So we looked at... Um, GAs versus evolutionary strategies um, just because of the additional steps within GAs you end up with more parameters that need to be tuned and typically longer execution time on your computer and um, that's worth bearing in mind. Um, one of the bottlenecks um, found in practice is that you're hitting your fitness function your objective function a lot and that's for a number of reasons so you've got a large population so you have to execute your fitness function many many times on that, that single generation but also that you're iterating through that multiple times um, as well as doing things like tournament selection so you need to think of ways of reducing um, the cpu load of your fitness function and there's various ways to do that including caching values um, using parallel execution um, and making sure that you're, you're only executing it when you really need to. So it needs some careful thinking when you, um, when you implement it. Um, so I'd also encourage you, um, when you're doing this in practice, to look at the state-of-the-art literature. Just a, a search by your favourite search engine will, will probably do that okay in practice. Um, so my experience of this is there's, there's, huge, uh, there's a huge literature out there and that has lots of ideas and conceptual ideas on how you would do this in practice. Um, but it's very unlikely you will find an academic who has published working code with their model. That's often kept held back, um, which, by the way, is very, very bad practice, but is the way academia works. Um, so it's unlikely you will find a solution out of the box from academia that you can, that you can use. However, there are, um, if you're using... Um, various packages. Even outside of Python, there are packages that offer um, out-of-the-box genetic algorithms that you can use. However, they may not offer you the efficiency that you want for your particular problem. 
So just to just to round things off, in, in summary, we've looked at evolutionary strategies versus a full genetic algorithm for placing healthcare facilities. Um, so the key steps in both of these processes um, is to start off thinking about how you would represent your problem. Once you've done that, you need to code a function that evaluates the fitness of a solution, preferably as efficiently as possible. Once you've got your way of doing that, you can then think about selection, crossover and mutation operators. So you need to pick those to start off with and then you need to code them and check they work. And then you need to bring those, those ingredients together in either an evolutionary strategy, such as Moolanda, or a genetic algorithm framework. And once you've got those bits and pieces, it's relatively straightforward to pull that into one of those frameworks. Then you need to apply that to your problem and typically tune your parameters. Um, so you might, for example, decide to think about different population sizes or if you're bringing elitism into either your evolutionary strategy or genetic algorithm, think about um, how elitist it's going to be and perhaps run a few experiments to see how it performs.